So let's go ahead and uh, kick this webinar. Hello, this is Ashutosh Bansal from Gita Cloud. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, it's my pleasure to bring you uh, this Touchless Forecasting Innovation webinar. NVIDIA and SAP are co-hosting this webinar with us. We have a global audience in terms of demand planners, colleagues from SAP, IBP practitioners from other organizations. So we extend a very warm welcome to you all. Quick housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, there's a survey at the end of this webinar. So please take a few more minutes to provide us with your feedback. Let's quickly review the panelists for this webinar. So we'll present the panelists in the sequence. Uh, we are going to present content to you today. Anthony uh, Nuguera, Business Operations Architecture at NVIDIA. It's my pleasure to host Anthony in this webinar. Anthony is a veteran, uh, 30 plus years at NVIDIA. He's uh, someone I know from uh, 2012 when uh, from SAP, I, uh, I represented SAP in uh, NVIDIA's uh, supply chain API implementation project. Uh, Anthony has led uh, both the APO and then the IBP implementations at NVIDIA. He's established the business uh, analyst organization from the ground up. He's very passionate about uh, supply chain innovation and uh, business operations architecture in general. So Anthony has been leading the uh, AIML co-innovation track with NVIDIA, uh, with SAP and uh, Gita Cloud. And uh, he's uh, worked really closely with us, providing us all the data, all the access to business uh, folks and uh, just overall alignment uh, across Gita Cloud and SAP. So welcome, Anthony. Uh, this is just a quick uh, bullets on myself. Uh, I've been in uh, the Valley uh, helping uh, supply chain uh, oriented requirements of high tech and other industries uh, for uh, the last 25 years now. I uh, was at SAP when IVP was uh, initially envisioned and uh, some of the action of uh, IVP and high tech, uh, I helped that action as well, uh, Broadcom, or Atmel or AMD or Smart Modular, many of the pilots initially. I uh, launched Gita Cloud in 2015 and uh, have been uh, very focused on uh, supply chain and IVP as a domain, uh, the innovation uh, aspects of it, uh, looking to go uh, deep into uh, high tech and other industries. So that's the work we've been doing. Uh, I'll also introduce the uh, Torch Tanger. Torch, uh, a uh, very known name, again, a veteran at SAP. He's the solution owner for SAP IVP demand. Uh, Todd's uh, representing SAP in this uh, innovation track uh, with uh, NVIDIA Gita Cloud and SAP. He's uh, helped us quite a bit uh, in uh, making sure that we get the best possible signal from IVP and, and uh, the overall coordination. So let's just quickly look at the agenda. We have uh, a uh, presentation from Anthony coming up, uh, where he'll talk about uh, the AIML co-innovation track at NVIDIA. He'll give us a sense of uh, the challenges, uh, the business uh, uh, side of uh, NVIDIA, also the overall manufacturing and distribution network, the planning processes, uh, why they are on the ML journey and how far they are. Uh, some of the action that we've uh, seen on the co-innovation track this year, and uh, then, then uh, plans going forward. I will then uh, take up the test test forecasting innovation and uh, walk through exactly why this uh, solution is required, what pain it uh, addresses, and the mechanics of the solution. Todd will then come in and talk about IVP as an AI platform, uh, just uh, both within demand forecasting and uh, across. So uh, one thing I just want to make sure uh, that we'll have a live Q&A at the end. So, uh, and we are going through quite a bit of deep dive in this webinar, so I'm sure you'll have questions. So we'll just park all the questions till the end, but please don't uh, wait to send us your question. The moment you think it, uh, please type it in. So that way we can look at it and we can prioritize the questions and uh, we'll try to answer as many or all of them in the Q&A. But if we miss out on some, we'll be sure to reach out to you after the webinar. So with that, uh, let me just uh, welcome Anthony. Anthony, you can go ahead, please share your screen. Thank you, Ash. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, 
All right, hello, uh, my name is uh, Anthony Nogueira from NVIDIA. So NVIDIA, as uh, some of you know, um, invented the GPU or graphics processing unit, which allowed video games to have outstanding images. So founded in 1993 uh, with headquarters in Santa Clara, we now have about 20,000 employees, uh, two thirds of which are engineers. Uh, from a gaming cards company, we have now evolved into an AI company where the bulk of our net revenues go into data centers that power AI. All right. Here you can see the breadth of NVIDIA's business. Uh, NVIDIA has been experiencing exponential revenue growth and their diversification in our product portfolio. In addition to PC graphics, NVIDIA is now creating platforms for artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, and scientific computing, to name a few. From the inventor of the GPU, NVIDIA has evolved into boards, systems, data centers, and software and services offering company. Business is growing rapidly with the launch of uh, products like Omniverse, Metropolis, Base Command, Fleet Command, NVIDIA AI, and 15 other new products slated for launch this year. Now, let me walk you through our uh, supply network and planning flows. NVIDIA is a fabulous semiconductor company. We do not produce our own cards on a mass scale. We buy wafers from TSMC or Samsung. We then have the wafers sliced and diced uh, into dyes and then assembled into chips by our other sub, sub partners. We use a combination of SAP APO and external operations research solvers to optimize our wafer starts, chip, chip assembly and test starts, and decide on an optimal mix of selling chips or building them into boards and selling boards or building them into systems and selling systems. We also have a uh, pretty elaborate uh, distribution, finished goods distribution flow once they are shipped to our Hong Kong warehouse and distribution centers. We get pretty decent uh, sales out and sell through information in our, from our partners and activations data come directly from the devices. Using SAP IBP and a handful of other forecasting tools, we forecast our sell-in and calculate a requested build plan that drives our backend production flow. All right, now let's talk about our, uh, our uh, current state and our challenges. So we have a monthly forecasting cycle uh, that starts with the regional planning planners across the globe providing a bottoms off forecast. Our corporate business units, we have about uh, 12 to 14 different business units. Um, they, uh, they then apply demand and supply factors to generate a revenue forecast. Then safety stock is added to the forecast to produce our RBP or requested bill plan that drives our supply plan processes. What, go, what data goes into our forecasting uh, processes? So we have bookings and backlog data and shipments uh, coming from SAP. Uh, we also look at like hub forecasts from customers, hub pools, we, uh, we look at uh, channel data from our partners um, and, and, and inventor, in inventory data throughout our distribution chain. And um, all right. And what do we forecast? So um, you've seen sort of like our distribution flow, right? So at every part of the flow, we forecast. We forecast our activations, we forecast our sell through, our sell out, our sell in. And, uh, and when we uh, when we do our calculate our sell in, we judge for supply constraints because our sell in forecast is, is what we we also what drives our revenue forecast. We also um, create build allocation plans. Uh, so this is where we we have a postponement model. So we we build our prefinished goods uh, to our to our forecast to our requested build plan. And then we, um, we also create a build allocation plan that maximizes the, the, 
the allocation of pre-finished goods to finished goods to maximize their revenue. And finally, we, uh, we also uh, forecast a revenue plan. All right, now let's talk about our challenges. So um, although we have the pockets of forecast automation among our different business units, for the most part, our forecasting is, is mostly judgment-based. And now that we are having uh, our, our SKU count increase, our demand planners are having difficulty scaling to the growing number of our GPUs. Uh, and um, also, you know, as, uh, as our forecast uh, uh, from cycle to cycle uh, account for some constrained supplies in, you know, in this uh, semiconductor constrained environment, our, our planners have a difficulty in sort of like uh, uh, going from cycle to cycle like accounting for these uh, supply constraints. And uh, whenever there is a revenue guidance uh, from our executive staff, there's also a challenge in uh, this at this aggregating that to the, to the SKU level because of some uh, you know, complications with the bookings and supply availability constraints. Um, in, our, uh, in our business, our ASP, uh, or out of your average selling price uh, impacts the demand. And uh, there's also this challenge in, uh, in um, assessing or modeling that uh, ASP impact on demand, especially during our product transitions. NVIDIA is pretty aggressive when, we come, when it comes to our uh, product cycle, right? And so we, uh, like within two years or so, we, we try to transition to a new architecture. So uh, uh, planning, uh, planning on uh, modeling the uh, impact of uh, ASP on demand is, is a challenge. And finally, uh, also regarding products and transitions, just, just sort of like to forecast, uh, to forecast the new uh, set of products uh, based on the prior, prior uh, generation products uh, is also a, uh, a challenge. Right. So uh, back in January this year, we, we felt the need to explore the capabilities of uh, SAP IVP demand sensing to improve our forecasting processes. So as I had worked very well with Ashutosh from Jita Cloud in the past, I chose to work with him together with uh, SAP on a demand pilot, uh, demand sensing pilot co-innovation. Now let me turn to Ash uh, to describe the good work that he has done for us. All right, Ash. Okay, thanks Anthony, that was great. Uh, so let's just, uh... And, and I hope uh, folks can still see my screen. So let me just uh, walk you through this journey. Uh, since uh, the start of the year, uh, we took uh, NVIDIA's data, uh, the bookings, their shipments, uh, their uh, forecast from a sales perspective, demand panel perspective. And we tried to come up with a forecast in the demand sensing horizon over the next six weeks. We also tried to uh, understand uh, the quality of the forecast and the improvement IVP uh, sense demand could deliver. Um, and uh, we were able to demonstrate a high uh, quality forecast, uh, more accurate forecast. So that uh, generated interest in uh, moving into phase two of uh, this journey. And in the phase two, uh, we moved the focus from demand sensing six, six, six weeks to a full next four quarters uh, forecast, which is how the demand forecasting process is set up to run. Uh, we took the same view that we had for the demand sensing phase one, and now moved into midterm demand forecasting mode for the entire data scope, all the SKUs in that view. We also expanded the scope uh, now uh, outside IVP, so not just within IVP gradient boosting and uh, ARIMINE or exponential smoothing, all the models that come within IVP. But we also went out and looked at uh, NVIDIA's Kratos platform as a GPU compute acceleration. Keep in mind that uh, the co-innovation was on two dimensions. One was the solution quality to say uh, well, how good a machine learning forecast can be compared to what we have. Second element of that was to say uh, what kind of acceleration uh, to the forecast run times can GPUs provide. And there are use cases in demand shaping, demand optimization, demand simulation where uh, the speed of forecasting becomes important to the business user. So uh, we also took uh, NVIDIA's Kratos platform, which is a GPU powered uh, compute in the cloud, 
and uh, deployed uh, some of our uh, machine learning models, uh, and I'll talk about them in a second uh, on that platform. We also took the cloud forecasting service and user forecast. So essentially, we brought together a lot more forecast uh, candidates, if you will, uh, and the data scope than we had in the phase one. And this is also the phase in which uh, we did this innovation for touchless forecasting to say when you have a lot of competing forecasts, how do you find the highest quality forecast, SKU by SKU, quarter by quarter. Just to give you a sense of uh, potential next steps, where we go from here, uh, we uh, could be doing any of those things, uh, data integration with SAP ERP to operationalize the phase one demand sensing and the phase two demand uh, forecasting pilots ingesting more driver data into the machine learning models. So taking ASPs, for example, macroeconomic data, channel sales and inventory, we found uh, some uh, data quality challenges, uh, as you can imagine, with the uh, external data. So we are trying to also look at uh, how to address those challenges and uh, uh, from a data collection frequency perspective. And uh, uh, sometimes you can have uh, good data from the channel, not from the OEMs and all that. So you have to address that. Also, uh, we're going to test some more models, especially focus on the deep learning side of models, not just machine learning. Uh, bring in ASP uh, as a driver, so start to understand the ASP elasticity curves to this kind of demand optimization pilot to say it's not enough to just uh, say, well, I have a certain revenue guidance, uh, let me uh, now figure out uh, one way of uh, matching to that revenue number, but really saying, well, given the supply constraints, given the uh, ASPs, uh, what would be the best uh, unit level forecast and knowing uh, that uh, ASPs are going to impact, uh, especially in product transitions, how to take that. And of course, uh, touchless forecast value audits to say not just uh, go on a faith basis. We have demonstrated high quality, but does it sustain? And are we on a continuous innovation improvement track to continue to reduce the error? So let me, with that, take you into the uh, actual guts of the touchless forecasting innovation. I uh, just want to paint a picture of, uh, before we say what it does and how it does it, let's uh, address the question, uh, why uh, do anything in this space at all? Uh, and um, Anthony, thanks uh, for outlining some of the challenges and video demand forecasting uh, process and demand planners have communicated. Uh, we, we talk to many customers in this industry and outside um, and, and we hear sort of many flavors of uh, problems when it comes to demand forecasting. So I wanted to paint a few here. Uh, one is, uh, in general, the moment you're talking about granular SKU or SKU location levels, the forecast error is quite high. So, of course, at a, a management measurement level, if you're looking at BU level numbers or technology portfolio level numbers, those numbers look somewhat decent, but uh, if you keep exploring it down to say, well, how are SKUs doing globally? How are SKUs doing from a locations perspective or by large end customers? You suddenly see the forecast quality uh, deteriorate, degrade quite a bit. So traditional forecasting approaches uh, just to do some kind of uh, forecast extrapolation with exponential smoothing, what we used to refer to as univariate forecasting, that is no longer effective, uh, just too much fragmentation and volatility uh, given the last couple of years of the pandemic here. So uh, that that uh, is a general common theme we hear that the forecast isn't delivering the quality that is expected for supply chain perspective. We also, uh, and Anthony referred to this directly, uh, the process starts uh, bottoms up somewhat uh, from sales and statistical forecasting perspective. You bubble it up uh, to the uh, executives and, and say, well, this is the kind of uh, revenue we forecast. And obviously you get a different guidance back. And now the challenge becomes how to disaggregate that down accurately back to SKUs. And, and you can take a 10% uplift to the total revenue and apply 10% uplift to all the units. It doesn't work cleanly like that because uh, some uh, SKUs may not have bookings, some may have supply constraints. So it becomes a problem of distributing in a feasible manner. Uh, there, there is also a general challenge uh, we heard from uh, some customers saying, well, they are doing things a certain way, uh, forecasting at a certain level, but they don't know if that's the best level to forecast at. So 
there's no ability to sort of uh, every forecast cycle pretty much test all the levels and figure out which level is the most forecastable. And even if you choose a different level, how to then continue to bring that signal down to SKU level in a good way. Some customers, and uh, this is uh, again a very widely varying continuum from an ML adoption perspective. Some customers are piloting the ML right now. Some have gone live with ML for a couple of years uh, in a couple of business units, not across the organization. For customers that have deployed ML and, and are seeing the results uh, in uh, production over a period of time, uh, they are experiencing a phenomena called model drift, which means the quality of the ML models start to go down uh, as the in-house uh, data science teams that put it together, their focus moves on to other uh, use cases or other business units. Uh, the hyperparameter fine tuning required uh, doesn't get the sufficient attention it should, and, and then the model quality starts to go down. In general, uh, and Anthony referred to this again, the processes uh, are not scalable either because the demand patterns are too fragmented now or number of SKUs. It's uh, just the amount of time given to the demand uh, review step. Uh, the planners just don't have enough uh, hours in the day to do justice to all the SKUs in every cycle. There's also a high bias. Uh, there is the sales forecast, the marketing forecast, Customers are telling you finance has guidance. A statistical data science team has a forecast. Demand planners have no effective way to blend all these forecasts at different levels, uh, different granularities, different time buckets uh, in an unbiased manner, right? It's uh, usually the loud, loudest voice wins and, and this need for a process that can take a lot of, uh, if you will, uh, sometimes uh, the same, sometimes competing, conflicting forecasts and then produce the optimal blended composite forecast without any bias. So that's sort of the problem side of the house. If you look at uh, how touchless forecasting helps, uh, one, obviously, um, IBP has uh, made, uh, SAP IBP, I mean, has made uh, good strides in terms of gradient boosting and uh, other models within IBP, which are machine learning. But uh, there are many, many more models out there, obviously. Uh, and SAP is on a journey to continue to bring more models in. But in the meanwhile, our approach is to look at all these models outside. So not just gradient boosting, but get boost, the category boost inside uh, some deep learning models like CNN or Random Forest, Profit. There's just so much out there. And, and essentially, uh, allow the data to go through all these model pipelines to see which model fits which data seed is the best, and then bring those forecasts back into IBP. So from a business user experience perspective, they're consuming the pick best stat forecast with an IBP, nothing changes for them. It's just the quality of the stat forecast, we are making sure it's the best possible forecast. We also uh, look at pretty much every cycle, it's part of our forecasting service, the forecast level and time bucket optimization. So we make sure that, uh, the level at which you're forecasting, the time buckets at which you're forecasting are making it the absolute most forecastable time series. And, and then also figuring out a way to accurately split and distribute that forecast down to SK. As part of the service, we also do uh, machine learning hyperparameter optimization. So for IBP practitioners, uh, they, they will know this, that uh, you select the gain boosting model. The tool either has defaults for parameters like number of trees, the, the max tree depth, the learning rate, and so on. Or you can change them, but essentially uh, you're just shooting darts in the dark. You have no way of knowing uh, what you're setting. There are infinite combinations of these parameters, which combination would provide the best outcome. There's something similar on the auto exponential smoothing side where alpha, beta, gamma parameters are optimized in IBP, but not on the machine learning gradient boosting side. So this is a part of our service to, to essentially optimize these parameters and produce the best possible ML forecast. From a SKU portfolio scaling, uh, we obviously need the touchless forecast uh, plays a huge role here where it can take all the machine learning signals, all the human forecasts and blend them autonomously and optimally. So the scalability and the sustainability of value, those challenges reduce. Uh, we also obviously are doing this in a very unbiased uh, 
vague across all the signals. So the composite forecast or what we call the touchless forecast has uh, much, much reduced. So hopefully this gives you a clear sense of uh, the challenges we hear and how touchless forecasting and, and forecasting as a service helps. Let me just uh, deep dive into exactly the kind of uh, models that we considered uh, in this uh, round phase two with NVIDIA. So obviously, uh, in, and this should not be news, the most uh, folks that uh, have used IBP or implement IBP should know this. These are all the models that SAP IBP has. Uh, some good uh, performance comes from Arima, uh, auto explanation smoothing, gradient boosting. A uh, challenge we are seeing uh, with COVID patterns is uh, the level of intermittency in the data is increasing. Uh, you, you have a lot more banks and periods because either supply constraints or, or demand issues and uh, inability to distribute and so on. So now uh, intermittent forecasts have always been a very hard thing to crack, right? Most uh, Forecast models uh, seemingly work much better when, when you have a value in every uh, time bucket, but when you start to experience a lot of uh, intermittency and planks is where things start to break down. So this is where we, we on NVIDIA Kratos uh, Cloud Compute Platform, we deployed uh, another, uh, uh, our data science team essentially wrote uh, gradient boosting uh, with Python and in Jupyter Notebook deployed it on Kratos and also deployed other models like Cat Boost, Random for, uh, Forest, Forecast. And then uh, you uh, also think about uh, Gita Cloud Forecasting Service that we are going through uh, a lot more models and uh, really optimizing the ML hyperparameters and saying what's the best possible uh, forecast. We called it external forecast because that's coming in from a third party into your environment. But that's another competing forecast, if you will. And then, of course, we had uh, the human inputs, right? Both from sales and demand planner. Remember Anthony talked about the NVIDIA process of sales provides the bottom sub view of the forecast uh, across their accounts and then uh, demand planners judge it, uh, working with uh, BUs and uh, there are kind of two versions of demand planner forecast, if you will, uh, constrained and unconstrained. But all of this is coming into what we then refer to as a touchless forecast. Right? So let's, now, just try to understand exactly how uh, the touchless forecast works. Before we go into it, I just want to make sure from a forecast uh, basis perspective, uh, everyone's clear that we had choices. We had both the booking history and the shipment history. Uh, we uh, just always, as a best practice, want to forecast the unconstrained demand, which is bookings, which is customer requested quantity and dates, uh, not shipment history. Uh, you forecast, you can forecast that too. But essentially, you are baking in all of your supply distribution constraints, right? So that's not a true representation of demand. Although shipment history and shipment forecast becomes important because that's directly linked to the revenue forecast. So you can see here a trend across quarters for uh, the data, and you can see how uh, in the initial uh, in these are fiscal periods. I'll explain uh, Nvidia's fiscal quarter uh, in a minute, but if you will initially see a lot more. Uh, bookings, uh, meeting shipments across quarters, but but see how this pattern changes in 2021 and 2022. So a lot more supply challenges coming. So uh, NVIDIA fiscal calendar uh, goes February to January. So you can think of it as when you're talking about Q1 of 2023, uh, that's essentially Feb 2022 uh, as a calendar month. So Feb to April is the Q1, uh, May to July is the Q2. Ones. So from uh, the experiment that we conducted, we uh, were provided data in the past, right? Uh, across uh, all the bookings and shipment history throughout, and then the user forecasts. We then chose to forecast Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 of 2022, which is sort of all in the past. So that's the booking history data we were provided. Uh, of course, NVIDIA has data on Q1 and now Q2. Uh, we deliberately did not collect all this data. So if you understand how uh, we are forecasting, we are forecasting in monthly cycles and in monthly buckets, but then we are aggregating it up into quarters. And the reason being that uh, when uh, planners are measuring error at NVIDIA, they are basically saying it doesn't matter if I forecasted 100 in month one and 110 in month two, and actuals come in differently, right? If actuals come in, for example, 95 and 115, 
to them, it doesn't matter if overall quarter is what they're looking to say, well, no matter when sales happen, my guidance uh, to the street is in quarterly buckets. So I want to measure error in quarterly terms. So we started the experiment in uh, what you would think of as uh, the previous quarter last month of that, uh, fiscal month 12 happens to be January 21 calendar month. That's where we forecasted the first cycle and we got sort of four quarterly values across the 12 monthly numbers, right? We refer to this as quarterly leg one, leg two, leg three, and leg four. We then move forward in time and now we are able to, like, as if we are sitting in April 21 calendar month or the last fiscal month of Q1, we forecast the next four quarters again, and you can see how the time axis shifted. So three of the quarters we have numbers from before, but now we have a new quarter being forecast. Again, as we dial the clock forward and we're now sitting in July, we can now say, well, again, let's forecast the next four quarters and do this one more time. And now you can see what's happening for a given quarter like Q4, you have quarterly lag one in uh, this uh, latest iteration four, the FM9 cycle. You also have a lag two view, a lag three view, and a lag four view, right? So we are able to now see four different forecast numbers, 600 when we were sort of four quarters ahead, uh, 660, three quarters ahead, 630 and 690. And this is what we refer to as lag. So it's just very important. I wanted to make sure I'm sure many of you get this uh, intrinsically, but for folks that are not familiar, these are quarterly lags we are looking at. And this is our way of saying, well, just a quarter ahead versus two versus three versus four, what was your forecast and what was the actual? So we made the error against the actual bookings in that quarter 680 against these four quarters. So hope this is clear. I'm going to move on. So as you can imagine, uh, we are uh, sitting in uh, a, let's say Q4 2021 last month and forecasting the next four quarters. It gives us from an IBP cash spread forecast perspective, uh, leg one, leg two, leg three, and leg four forecast. We also, when we are, let's say at this point in time, and we now have a sense of actually what happened in the quarter and what did you forecast, we are able to measure the error in that leg one forecast by comparing it to the spooking history. When we move the clock further back in time and we have booking history for Q2 as well, we are now able to see how the leg two IBP forecast was two quarters ahead versus what bookings were. And you can imagine this leg one error versus leg two error to be different values because the further ahead you're looking, the, the more likely you are to be. We do the same uh, with a naive forecast, which is simple moving average over the last three months. This is our way of saying, well, and you'll be surprised given the level of volatility, uh, sometimes uh, the naive forecast is uh, pretty close to or beating uh, some more sophisticated models because it's just uh, the trends are too volatile and fragmented. So what we do from a forecast value at perspective, we take uh, the IBP forecast, the naive forecast, we compare the two to say, well, how is IBP forecast helping? How much more accurate or how much less error is IBP producing? So the way we measure forecast value add is the naive error minus the IBP error. And you can imagine we do this for leg one, we do this for leg two. So now we have a leg one FE and a leg two FE. Similarly, we'll have leg three and leg four. You can see this uh, with some data. Before I jump into the data, just uh, understand the SKU level absolute percent error, APE. Uh, we are taking the absolute of the forecast minus actual and then dividing it by actuals. Now, obviously with intermittent uh, series, when you have uh, no value to report in actuals, you get a divide by zero problem. So we basically say if either the forecast or actuals are blank, but not both, we count the errors 100%. Either you forecasted, didn't sell anything or you didn't forecast you did, well, the error is 100%. So this does inflate, inflate the overall error, but it, it gets away from the divide by zero. Also, if both forecast and actuals are blank, then of course we say, well, you forecasted nothing, you're selling nothing, so you're zero error. And with this approach, we are not limiting the error to 100%. It can be 200, 300, 400, 500%. So we try to get a true sense of the error 
because the more wrong you are, the supply chain is building all those materials, the cost to business is high. So we don't uh, just report accuracy as one minus error, we report error and let it be unbounded. So let's get back to this. Let's say for, for a given STU 393 uh, in Q4 2022, and this is fiscal Q4, if uh, they sold 19,200 units and like one IBP forecast was 19,780. So you can see these two numbers here. The absolute difference is 580. So IBP obviously did really well forecasting it. Uh, 580 divided by 9,200 is 3%. You can see there. That's leg one. If you look at lag two, uh, lag two IBP had forecasted, uh, meaning two quarters before IBP had forecasted 26.52. And given uh, that error is slightly more than 3%, it's 8%. So you can see how the error is kind of growing the, the more uh, in future you're looking at. The higher the lag, higher the error in general. Also understand that that's SKU level absolute percentage error. We are doing a weighted MAPE across all the SKUs at, at a higher level. So if uh, let's take a product group PG1 as a simple example. If you have two SKUs, 318 and 393, and both have sold certain quantities, and, and you can see for leg one, uh, SKU 318 is uh, 18,500 is sold uh, with 6% error. The other 393 sold 19,200 with 3% error. So we are essentially doing a weighted uh, error with uh, the actual booking quantity, booking history being the weight that is being applied. So with this approach, if something is selling a lot and uh, has high error, then obviously that error counts. If something is selling very little, has high error in the larger scheme of things to the business, it doesn't matter as much. Now, we do have the ability to also see the unweighted uh, raw error averaged at higher levels but I'm just showing you the weighted mean. So essentially you can see for leg one, across the two uh, at product group level, the weighted average error is 4%. You can also see this for leg two. Uh, leg two uh, is, uh, the history remains the same obviously, but uh, error as you can see in IBP was much higher, 44% at leg two in this case, and 8% uh, for this other SKU. So when you combine the two, you get 25%. So now this is a clean way of understanding your weighted average error across leg one and leg two. Hope this is clear. So I'm going to move on. Remember I talked about the forecast value add as the naive forecast error minus the IBP error. So for the same SKU, if you look at what is the IBP error, you can see that uh, naive forecast was 49%, IBP error was 3%, and hence the uh, difference between the two, 49 minus three, you get the IBP leg one forecast value add as 46%. Obviously there will be a leg two forecast value add and leg three and so on, but this is one way of understanding that when naive forecast is uh, showing less error, uh, this forecast value add actually turns negative. And that's how we alert and uh, alert the planners to say a certain part of the process is not functioning. So now that hopefully you've clearly understood the quarterly lag uh, concept, the uh, weighted MAPE concept and the forecast value add, let's look at the actual results across. Uh, and this is a subset of SKUs. We are not reporting data for all the SKUs, but uh, for this subset, you can see, and uh, just uh, so everyone's clear what these bars represent, this, this last uh, gray bar is the naive error, right? The naive forecast error. And uh, this, we are reporting the lag one error in fiscal quarter four of FY 2022. The naive error was 121%, obviously the highest. And most of the times we observed that. We had the demand planner forecast error here, which is uh, really good. You only see 81% error uh, compared to the 121 and naive. The Kato's uh, XGB, the extreme gradient boosting error is here. Uh, it obviously has much higher error. IBP, forecast error is somewhere here. It's uh, better than uh, Kato's XGB across the board, but uh, the demand panel obviously has more insights into the business and, and they're doing better. And sales forecast error, external forecast, which is uh, Gita Cloud Service. And you would notice that uh, this external forecast error is 78%, so it's doing really well across. 
There are some other models like get boost and random forest and so on. So all of those are represented here. So I know this is a lot of data to absorb. So hopefully you can correlate the colors and the numbers and, and get a sense of that. So that's the error. If we look at the forecast value app side of it, you can essentially the same colors are represented here. So it's easy to color code. So just think of uh, compared to the naive error, which is 121, demand panel was 81. 81 versus 121, you're looking at 40% value. If you look at IBP, it's got 21% value at. Uh, in Q4, uh, you can see that uh, this is the uh, Plato Standard Forest 25 or touchless forecast 31, they're, they're doing better. But uh, in general, you can see in all the machine learning signals, the touchless forecast has done the best. When we looked at the average error across the quarters, so this is a picture for you to understand from quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. If you go across the three and we took an average again for lag one, uh, the numbers are now slightly different. Uh, the, the touchless forecast uh, value add is 15%. It's almost matching the demand panel value add. So without any insights into the business, it's able to uh, come very close or, or look at the other way, all the machine learning signals, uh, the external forecast from Gita Cloud is at 10%, IBP is at 5%, some of the other models are 3, 2, and 3. So the touchless forecast, which is taking the best uh, input from all the forecasts, is just simply out of it. So that's, in a nutshell, the value add uh, supported by data. Let's talk about exactly how uh, we are generating the touchless forecast. So remember I spoke about uh, if you're forecasting a given quarters uh, and, and four quarters ahead, so you have like one, like two, like three, and then like four. So if you were at this point in time in January 20, and you forecasted Q4 2021, you will have a command planner like four forecast at Kratos, IBP, sales, and so on, right? When we look at the forecast value add across the board, we compare and let's say we found the external forecast value add to be the highest. Then we record this as the FBA winner for this quarter for leg four. If we dial back uh, to Q1 and we say, well, just three quarters ahead, now all these are like three value adds, right? Uh, again, compare and say, well, who won, who's the most accurate three quarters ahead? And let's say in this case, Kratos uh, get boost uh, turned out to be the most accurate, adding the most value. So you just now can clearly see that leg four uh, external and Kratos and IBP. This is how you getting different. When you're looking at uh, these uh, like one, two, three, and four winners, demand planner, IBP, Kratos, and external, uh, you are looking at now in the touchless forecast, taking the demand planner forecast in lag one and using that for your first quarter. Lag two, taking your IBP forecast and putting that as your second quarter taking the like three Kratos and putting that as the third quarter. So what you're doing is instead of saying any particular forecast across the four quarters, you're taking in a quarter specific way, the most accurate forecast. This is how we generate the touchless. And obviously as we move forward in time, you can see different uh, winners emerging uh, in different lags, sometimes the same winner, sometimes different. And that's how we keep generating. And this is all being done for SKU one. We can also see that we're doing this for SKU2. You may get completely different winners. The idea is that every cycle, every quarter, every SKU touchless forecast is being optimally planned. So this is just, um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, going to go through some of these slides really fast here. I'll leave some time for Todd and for Q&A. But uh, the FEA winner you can see, in this case, demand planner was one. So we select that as one, Kratos as two, because that's the highest FEA, we set that as two. In this case, uh, IVP uh, was the most accurate in both cases, uh, in Q3 and in Q4. So we are selecting the value three. And that's how the Tesla forecast is coming together. So when you're looking at SQ393 or lag one, we just say, well, in this case, my forecast one. So we just grab the value of my forecast into the touchless, right? 16,828. In this case, uh, the demand panel was the most accurate. So like one, take 13,510, drop that into the touchless forecast. See how this behavior changes when you are in like two. 
Uh, leg two, you are going two legs out. So when you are naive forecast being the most accurate, you skip and say, well, what was the naive forecast? Two got us out, grab that into the touch test. Here uh, you see uh, IBP was the most accurate. So we go two got us out, take the value in IBP forecast and put that into touch test. So hope this is clear. Uh, this is uh, the last uh, point I wanted to make. Uh, we also have like a FBA heat map to say, well, at a SKU by SKU level, who's uh, winning most often? And if you think of these numbers, one being demand planner, two being creators, three being IBP, four sales, five external, so on. You can see in uh, Q2, IBP is winning a lot of SKUs, right? Where it is simply the most accurate signal. In some cases, you can see uh, the naive forecast winning, or in some cases, other models are winning. But uh, this pattern, you can quite clearly see when you go from Q2 to Q3, it changes rapidly, right? So now there's a lot more once in the picture, meaning demand panels more accurate, um, many more SKUs. So this is the dynamism in the data. And this is why you just can't scale this uh, manually. You have to have an automatic approach every quarterly cycle. When you look at the average across Q2 to Q4, uh, you see a decent number of cases where demand panels turn the best, and that's expected. But also in a decent number of cases, IBP is doing very well. And then there are cases where the other models Okay, so let me just uh, wrap this up uh, in terms of the key takeaways we want you to have. Uh, we are able to generate an accurate demand signal at granular levels autonomously. Uh, keep in mind, different models are performed in different horizons. So we cannot just take a weighted average uh, approach and just plan 10% of everything across all the quarters. That's not the way to uh, value. Um, and we are able to provide planners control, meaning uh, the touchless forecast we generate, they're still able to override it in some exceptional situations. We track that if that helps or not. So this approach is very flexible, leaves planners in control, uh, allows for very easy ingestion of additional human or machine signals. Right? In the end, you get a much lower error and a much higher planner productivity. They don't have to uh, struggle with uh, blending as a process for every SK. So hope that was clear. I would uh, just at this point like to give it to uh, Todd. Todd, please go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Ash. Let me, oops, things moved on me for a second. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through this fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, I just have a, a couple slides and some comments. And, and uh, you know, thanks, Ash, for uh, a very nice overview of kind of what you have done. Uh, so, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the different models uh, that, that Ash used uh, in, you know, in forecasting, uh, so machine learning algorithms uh, that we have in IVP, uh, so, you know, the gradient boosting. Uh, we also have, in addition to that, we also have demand sensing, uh, short-term forecasting algorithms. Uh, we have, you know, our traditional demand sensing algorithm as well as a new one uh, for with utilizing XGBoost. Uh, we also, as Ash noted, that we also have Arima, Sarima, you know, Remax, Remax. Uh, we have all of those for using external data. Uh, if you want to do that, uh, we're also bringing to bear, and and we didn't really talk about this in this use case, but uh, we're also bringing in data analysis tools, so change point detection uh, in your history uh, using machine learning. Uh, so we're also uh, doing some of that analysis historically to help you apply better models. Um, a few other things that we have within IVP in the machine learning space, uh, we do allow uh, using doing the segmentation. So if you're doing an ABC XYZ segmentation, we do allow using uh, using clustering techniques to determine what the uh, the different classes should be for you know whether it's ABC or ABCD. Uh, you can you don't have to arbitrarily just pick some you know volume or variability to determine those. Uh, the system can determine those for you. Uh, if we uh, also look in, we are also using clustering techniques with alerts and exception management. Uh, so, uh, you know, the idea of instead of, again, picking an arbitrary value to, to trigger an alert, uh, you can actually use cluster-based uh, alert determination methods. Uh, this is as easy as just hitting a checkbox uh, when you build an alert within IBP. Uh, we are working also on using machine learning techniques to recommend actions for alerts. We do have the playbooks. Uh, that you can do. So within a company, you can actually specify what the next steps might be. 
but we are working on some some uh, projects around you know better alert recommendations. Uh, we have something that we rolled out that uh, may not be very well known, but uh, we have a whole master data rule mining and anomaly detection uh, technique, which is really to try to clean up planning master data. Uh, we know that although companies do have master data processes, we get data from R3 uh, or ECC or, or you know, S4HANA, even an SAP shop. Uh, that sometimes the data doesn't make sense for planning. Uh, and so identifying where there are some problems with the data is a very key topic. Uh, you know, we do certainly have supply planning, uh, optimization techniques, uh, inventory optimization uh, that we have to help solve some of the supply problems that you have. Uh, we are rolling out uh, something that we call hyperparameter setting for supply optimizer. Ash talked about the demand planning case where you know, models can drift and you need to do parameter tuning on uh, even uh, models that have are using uh, machine learning. Uh, for the supply optimizer, we actually are using machine learning to help tune uh, the parameters that deal with the goodness of the, the, the uh, solution versus uh, solve time. Uh, there are two options that you can do within the optimizer. Uh, and so with this, you just hit a checkbox and we're using all of the optimizer runs across customers using IVP to identify what the better parameters are to set that. Uh, certainly we can do process control, alerts, triggers. Uh, we're also using um, you know, batch job anomaly detection in our uh, operations uh, side of things. So again, where we have uh, maybe a forecasting job is running longer for some reason or supply planning is running longer than normal uh, to notify uh, somebody within your company to identify that. Uh, and then uh, we also, and this was, although this was not part of uh, what Ash did uh, in this, uh, we, uh, in this uh, example that he showed, uh, because it just came out earlier this year, uh, we do have the ability to call custom forecasting models from within IVP. Uh, so we have an API that can actually uh, include, so some of the models that Ash talked about building externally. Um, we can actually bring those in and use the, you know, the best fit to help identify which model would be best uh, from an overall perspective uh, and also include any new product introduction, uh, you know, data that you have as well when we run the forecasts. Uh, a couple other uh, sort of extensions to IVP, uh, we do have what we call lead time recommendations. Uh, so this is actually a technique to uh, use all of your ERP data to calculate better lead times than just whatever you've been using for planning. Uh, this is actually de deployed as a BTP mission. Uh, so there's actually a link you can go to uh, for BTP missions. And we give you all the all of the information, any Python scripts or, or code uh, that you need uh, to implement that, plus instructions of how to do it. Uh, and then that can extract out the data and come up with lead time recommendations. And then you can write those to uh, IBP to adjust your lead times for supply. Uh, the other project that we're working on is uh, you can either call this you know, pattern or production wheel optimization from a supply planning perspective. Uh, this will also be a, a BTP mission uh, to extend the capabilities of IBP. Uh, if we look at just the, the general demand planning roadmap, uh, quickly, I'll point out a couple things. Uh, we talked about the, um, you know, we talked about the external forecasting algorithms that came out in May of this year. Uh, we also came out with a new Croston TSB method for intermittent demand. Uh, so that's a new algorithm that we have. Uh, if you look at what's coming in the future, uh, you'll see product lifecycle management showing up a lot, uh, especially out in 2211 and 20, uh, 2302. Uh, this is a project that we're doing to reimagine how people are doing new product introductions. Uh, and it's got several aspects of it, redoing the UI, uh, as well as we're looking at how we can uh, leverage uh, essentially, um, you know, using machine learning to identify demand patterns for new products and then apply those to the new products. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on in that. You'll see several, um, several things in, the, in that area over the next, uh, the next roadmap. Um, we are also including the demand sensing, the decomposition of demand sensing results. So we do this today for gradient boosting and, uh, and the REMA models. Uh, but basically, this is if you bring in external factors showing you know, which, which factors are really um, relevant to your forecast and driving your forecast. Uh, so we'll have some better reporting and demand sensing on that. Uh, that's using the XG boost algorithm. Uh, and then we're doing some parameter optimization for Croston TSB out in the, in the future. 
Uh, so we are still continuing to innovate in the demand planning space. Uh, as Ash said, we are also continually looking for additional algorithms that we can bring in. Uh, and so we will continue to do that, uh, although we don't always place those on, on the roadmap. Uh, so with that, that's kind of my high level that we have. I'll, I'll pass it back to Ash for, uh, for doing Q&A. Thanks, Todd. I will just, uh, uh, at this point, I think we have five minutes left. So let's uh, just, uh, I'll leave this slide more as an anchor slide saying uh, where Giza Cloud can help uh, across discovery implementation and value optimization services. You can read the slide, uh, but at this point, let's uh, look at the questions. So folks, if uh, you haven't already asked your question, please uh, go ahead and type it in. Uh, we will take a look at the questions that have already been asked. So uh, I'm reading one uh, question uh, from Anand Kalash. Uh, did you handle sporadic demand in any of the scenarios? Yes, as I uh, mentioned before, there was a very high level of intermittency across multiple SDUs. So that that was handled, yes. Another question I'm seeing, are you not seeing that under best fit, Arima Croston tends to flatten the forecast, uh, even the new TSP? Uh, that can happen in some cases, and this is where machine learning comes in handy. There are some of the other models, uh, especially Cat Boost, Rhino Forest, et cetera, uh, do, do good justice and, and produce uh, forecasts that are essentially not flat. So this is uh, one key point behind sending a uh, set of intermittent data through a lot of models. So even if some are not, uh, some are flatlining, you, you still get an accurate forecast from the uh, Another question, how did you integrate external forecasts such as Kratos and Gita Cloud Service to IVP through BDP platform? Uh, yeah, we could do it that way. Uh, Todd mentioned that there's a external forecasting API, that's also a very nice way to bring this in uh, for uh, the purposes of uh, NVIDIA uh, progress so far. We've essentially just uh, loaded the data into IBP using CPI. Let's keep moving. So how are you feeding in the external forecast models? Are you finding uh, the process to be effective? Yeah, I, I think overall we've had uh, good success addressing a lot of uh, models and uh, both deploying on NVIDIA platform as well as our service and bringing that data back into it. So I'm reading this another one. Uh, one of the challenges for the ML forecast is availability of large amounts of data. How large was the historical data? Is the data starting from 2020 enough for machine learning models to learn? Yeah, so we had data from 2017 onwards. We were only in slides showing 2020 to make sure the slide doesn't get too crowded. So yes, we had uh, three years of data, but uh, like Anthony had uh, mentioned, uh, many of NVIDIA SKUs, the life cycle doesn't go across two years. So you don't really get the benefit of uh, SK level forecasting, which is where the overall aggregate level forecasting and disaggregation comes into play. So I'm reading a couple more here. You mentioned about the COVID impacted period history, how the framework takes care of such kind of fabric history, either very low or very high booking. So it's a good question. Our data science team uh, did, did a lot of what we call the outlier correction optimization where they were looking at the trends and that's part of the service to say, not just blindly applying some outlier detection, but really understanding the data and really fine tuning the outlier. Are you leveraging external forecasting integrated call from IBP forecast model introduced? Uh, that's external forecasting as Todd mentioned. Uh, we did not use it uh, so far, but that's definitely the plan if we uh, move forward uh, with the next phase. Next question, how does the model take care of direction change in the bookings given there are no other signal drivers in the models? So, we did uh, send a lot of uh, forecast uh, drivers, if you will, uh, look for impact analysis. So we didn't share that uh, update today, but uh, we did see uh, at SKU by SK level quite a significant amount of variation in terms of uh, which uh, underlying driver was driving most of that forecast. And uh, across the board uh, was a different picture than at SKU level. So yes, you have to look at uh, data to understand the impact there. 
another question, how much of a role did independent variables play in the more advanced ML algorithms? I think I just answered that question. What if a company doesn't have all these things? So you just start with what you have. Uh, there is a lot available internally, even if you just look at uh, ASPs and promotion history and supply constraints, uh, you should have all that along with the booking and shipment history. The uh, most places they have some element of channel uh, history, channel inventory, uh, some element of macroeconomic data is always available publicly. So we would uh, say that most customers that are on an ML journey are able to get quite a lot of the demand driver values. Obviously, the challenge remains where you have to forecast certain drivers. How accurately can you do that? Because the error in the driver forecast will lead to the error of the model. Okay, so I think. That's all the time we had. Uh, we've gone a uh, couple of minutes over. So there are a few more questions. I will uh, just uh, reach out to those folks. Uh, again, uh, just want to thank Anthony and Todd uh, for their support with this webinar, the production, the close partnership throughout this year. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, also wanted to uh, mention Laura Tosso, uh, the SAP IBP product owner for our work with us in defining the IBP forecast signal quality. Thank you, Laura. And also a special note of thanks to Andy McAllier for getting the alignment, getting uh, the marketing and then pushing the message out, getting the webinar, uh, the, the visibility. So Andy, thanks for that too. And again, thank you everyone uh, for uh, attending this webinar. We'll just uh, get a recording out to you uh, shortly here. I uh, hope you like the content. Please do give us uh, the feedback in the survey. Uh, that's all I had for now. Uh, Anthony, Todd, any uh, last remarks from you? No, no, thank you. Uh, it was such a, it's a very uh, nice experience uh, working on this with you and uh, with Todd.